good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jen Westendorf. I'm the director of the Musculoskeletal Research <coughs> Training Program at Mayo Clinic. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Poria Rusrock, who's going to give the third uh, workshop here, third presentation in our work on our series on machine learning and AI, AI technology for musculoskeletal diseases. This is funded by the NIH and as a supplement to our training grant. So we're really happy to be able to provide this to the community today. Uh, Dr. Ruzrock is a postdoctoral fellow in the radiology informatics lab at Mayo Clinic. He also works in the orthopedic surgery AI laboratory or o OSAIL, as we like to say. Uh, Dr. Ruzrock was trained at Tehran University of Medical Sciences in Iran, where he received an MD, a master's of public health and a master's in health profession, professionals uh, education. So Poria gave the first lecture in this workshop, and I'm glad that he's back again to give our third lecture. So Poria, take it away. Sure. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm happy that I'm with you today for my second workshop and your third workshop in this series in general. And I would like to seek permission from my mentors, Dr. Ressendorf, Dr. Mardit Kremers, and Dr. Erickson, who are all available at this call to start this presentation. I hope that we can have uh, a good talk together. So. I am going to talk about uh, applications of machine learning in medical imaging. Uh, this sometimes is also called computer vision in medicine, but uh, as I will tell you uh, a few minutes later, this is something that some people also uh, want to call else, you know, I mean, uh, something else. So I'm going to briefly review the different aims that we are going to uh, have, you know, talk about today. I'm going to start talking about the scope and applications of machine learning medical imaging in general. This will give you uh, hopefully a big picture of what machine learning can do in medical imaging. And then we will talk about medical imaging data itself and how to collect that, what properties of that data is and things like that. And hopefully these first two parts will actually give you uh, enough information to understand what is happening in the world of AI and ML when we apply that to medical imaging. And then in the third part, this is where things get a little bit more technical. I would like to talk about the most fundamental concept of computer vision and machine learning in medical imaging, and that is the concept of convolutions and convolutional neural network. We will have a lot of animations and GIF images here. So this is the most technical part of the talk, but I wanted to put that after these two first general parts so that we make sure that we cover the basics first. And then finally, we will go through a couple of slides uh, and review resources for further learning for you know data scientists or those who might not want to do the programming, but are only interested in machine learning and medical imaging. So this is actually our general plan for today. I would try to go through these first two parts a little bit faster because I want to spend enough time on the third aim, but please feel free to interrupt me wherever you want it. Feel free to ask questions. I would also make sure to have an eye on the chat box here. And then uh, we will, I will also pause at the end of each of these aims to make sure that we are all on the same page and following each other. So uh, let's start uh, and talk about the scope and applications first. Now. Uh, I would like to start with one recap slide, and this presentation is going to have about six or seven recap slides from, uh, you know, my own presentation that I had in the first workshop of this series and also Alex's presentation. So this is only to remind you of the concepts, the basic concepts that we went through, because, you know, ML has a lot in common, regardless of what uh, specific uh, you know application you're looking at. I mean, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at computer vision or you know, natural language processing, some of the basic concepts are going to be the same. So it's worth uh, reminding ourselves of some of these basic concepts first. So if you remember in our first workshop, we talked about what AI, ML, and deep learning mean, right? So AI was any technique which enabled us or enabled computers, better to say, to mimic human behavior. And then machine learning was a subset of AI, or better to say, some kind of AI algorithms that were able to automatically learn from data without needing us to explicitly telling them what to do or programming them what to do. So these are the kind of applications that are nowadays uh, considered almost the state of the art application of AI. And then in machine learning, we had a separate, or better to say, a subset that was called deep learning. And deep learning denoted those kind of machine learning algorithms which could effectively learn from big data using artificial neural network. And if you remember, we talked about neural networks, what they mean, 
the different architectures they had, and I'm going to quickly review those um, in the third part of this presentation as well. But the most important point was that, you know, neural networks make us capable of applying machine learning to big data, to very, very big data sets. And, you know, this could be big imaging data sets or text data sets or tabular data sets, whatever. Uh, so deep learning and neural networks are, you know, most of the times what people tend to use or prefer to use whenever they are applying machine learning. Uh, of course, the most important exception is actually the tabular data where conventional machine learning is uh, working uh, pretty, pretty good in many instances, as Alex talked in our last workshop. But for medical imaging that we are going to review today, deep learning is almost always the state of the art technique that we use. And we sometimes try to amend that using conventional machine learning as well. So, that was what we talked about. And you do remember that conventional machine learning was a subset of machine learning that did not include deep learning. Now let's talk about computer vision. So computer vision is a branch of machine learning uh, that focuses on imaging data as input to the model. So this is not a term specific to medical world, right? So uh, whoever who works in AI and machine learning fields have probably heard about uh, computer vision. So computer vision means whenever you are working on, uh, on you know, any type of imaging data as your input. Now, uh, no, likewise, application of machine learning, medical imaging could also be regarded as computer vision with one important side note. And that side note is that, you know, sometimes uh, uh, some people believe that, you know, applying machine learning on 3D medical imaging data, which, you know, we are still consider them as medical imaging in our own medical world might not be regarded as computer vision because computer vision, you know, most of the times uh, in engineering world denotes applying machine learning to 2D data, natural images, for example, right? So sometimes people have different terms for calling what we are, uh, you know, uh, what we mean by saying medical imaging and machine learning. But for the sake of this workshop, I am going to keep using the term machine learning in medical imaging rather than computer vision to make sure that I'm also emphasizing applying machine learning to 3D medical imaging data as well as 2D. So I am going to quickly review the different applications of computer vision in medicine. So I have put five different, five main applications here. Definitely there could be more, but these are the five most common. And I'm going to quickly introduce each, provide some examples to you, and then you know make sure that you understand what each of these applications mean and how this could be useful in real research or you know in real clinical applications. We will talk about classification, regression, segmentation, object detection, and image generation. So let's just start with classification first. And then, as I said, at the end of these five, five slides, I would like to pause and make sure that everybody is following. So if you had any questions and if it was urgent, feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, I will pause and ask you about your questions. So classification basically means that you are receiving or your model is receiving some images as inputs. And you, know, you want the model to classify those images into predefined categories. So for example, suppose that you have this input X-ray, chest X-ray on the right, and you want your model to understand whether this chest X-ray belongs to a patient suffering from COVID-19 or you know, uh, to a patient that is suffering from some other type of pneumonia or even some sort of other now, lung diseases. So this was actually something that a lot of papers talked about and went through when COVID started. You know, uh, actually COVID helped AI a lot, specifically in medical imaging, because a lot of people were enthusiastic to see if these models are capable enough to understand, you know, or, you know, to to understand the diagnosis or the prognosis of COVID nineteen patients. And I will talk about this a little bit more. There were also a lot of flaws there when you know this bunch of papers came out. But anyway, this is one of the papers that you know had been cited more than others. So you see that they had tried to understand whether this patient had COVID-19 or nine, uh, COVID-19 or not using medical uh, machine learning applied on medical imaging. And you know, this kind of uh, uh, fancy image that you see on the right side, this colorful image is uh, a tool that we have to show how these models are actually making their predictions or how, how they are actually making their decisions. These are not quiet, uh, accurate tools, but they give us some sense. They give us some clues of what is happening behind the scenes. You remember probably from our previous workshops that deep learning were most of the times criticized to be black boxes so that people will not understand how they are making their decisions because as I said, there were very, very big equations. So nobody could really understand what is happening behind the scene. Some efforts had been made to make those a little bit more explainable. One of these uh, you know, famous efforts had been this kind of maps that we usually call them salience map or you know, gradient activation maps. And these show that, for example, these you know, uh, highlighted yellow parts of the image have been those areas that the model 
uh, more emphasized on for making its predictions that this, for example, belongs to the COVID-19 patient. So if you saw this kind of images in, you know, machine learning classification kind of papers, this probably is trying to explain the model's behavior. But anyway, so what, what I mean, how do we use these classification models in medical world? We usually use them for uh, say, you know, we want to diagnose some diseases in patients or we want to pro I mean, predict their prognosis. For example, we feed some sort of images, CT data, MRI data of patients with, you know, uh, you know, brain tumors and we want to understand how long the patient is going to survive or if they have good prognosis, uh, you know, saying that they are going to survive after two or three years or if they are going to unfortunately die earlier. So these are the kind of applications that we usually can uh, expect from classification models. And so, you probably remember that whenever we talk about a machine learning project, specifically in those type of projects that were supervised machine learning, which basically means that the model is going to learn from labeled data, we needed to consider the time, effort, and energy that we need to put into data annotation, right? So I'm going to specifically mention the annotation needed for each of these uh, you know, machine learning applications in medical imaging. So if you are going to develop a classifier or a machine learning classification model, for medical data, you probably need to have your experts go through some of these images. You know, they could be X-rays, they could be CT data, MR data, PET, sono, whatever modalities you are working on, and ask them to label individual images or scans uh, with those categories that you're interested in. So, for example, uh, people who actually authors or co-authors who actually developed this paper, uh, they had ex an expert team that went through, say, you know, 2,000 X-rays, you know, 10,000 X-rays. Uh, have, you know, whatever. So, and they try to uh, look at the x-rays and some experts say, you know, whether or not this patient had COVID-19 or not, or even better than that, they looked at some sort of PCR test and say that, you know, these patients with COVID-19, uh, you know, a COVID-19-like x-ray, we confirmed that had really COVID-19, you know, looking at their PCR test, for example. So you need to have some sort of labeling annotation for these kind of classifiers if you want to train them in a supervised manner. Sometimes you need experts to go through those and label them for you manually, which definitely would take more time and energy. Sometimes you will have, you know, gold standard answers like from pathological images or, you know, from PCR tests or whatever. So anyway, you should consider the annotation needed for these kind of classifiers. Can I ask a question here? Sure, for sure. So uh, how would uh, the software or the AI model determine a COVID-19 lung with, with any other fibrosis like smokers or like countries where there is too much pollution? Yep. Uh, a related question with that is, so if you have a, a tissue consistency, let's say in the lung and with COVID-19, you see also systemic effects. Mm -hmm. Can that image uh, learning uh, AI model can recognize the same uh, consistency of tissue or changes in different, uh, in, like, let's say in this image, there is heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yep. have I made my question clear? Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I understood you. So, so let me go through your first question now first. So, uh, you know, part of the reason that classification and, you know, machine learning engineering in general is something quite tricky is that you need to pay close attention to what your model is learning, right? You need to provide these models with useful data to learn. So as you said, if we only put, you know, COVID-19 x-rays into a model and then we put normal x-rays as, you know, kind of, the other class to the model and ask the model to understand whether or not patients have COVID-19 or not, the model would probably confuse COVID-19 with all other non-normal type of x-rays that are out there, right? So other type of pneumonia, interstitial diseases, or other things there. So part of the task that data scientists need to do is that they need to put together very accurately built data sets for training. So for example, in the days of COVID-19, what we wanted the models to specifically focus on was to discriminate COVID-19 x-rays from normal patients, but also from other type of pneumonias, or as you said, maybe uh, smoker lungs or you know ILDs or whatever other kind of diseases that we had there. So for those reasons, those data sets that you know, actually resulted in the best models, those were consisting of not only COVID-19 and normal x-rays, but also other classes of x-rays. For example, x-rays from patients with pneumonia, but not COVID-19 pneumonia, or from, for example, from lungs that had been suffering from smoking or other type of interstitial diseases. So 
yes, the answer to your question is that it all depends on the data sets that we are putting together for these models. And we need to be very careful there. Now to your second question, uh, if I understood your question right. So the point is that, you know, we can, and this is something that we always want to do, that you know, we feed in not only the x-rays, but some sort of other variables as well. So sometimes we combine imaging variables with clinical variables. So for example, say that you know, I train the same classifier here to realize if a patient has COVID-19 or not, but I also feed in the age and sex of the patients. And at the same time, I might also feed in, I don't know, maybe some lab data out of those patients, right? So, so we have, we are somehow merging clinical data, our tabular data to say, and this imaging data, right? And this is again, going something to be quite useful for the models. And if you train your model on multiple type of modalities, say imaging data and tabular data, sometimes imaging and text data, sometimes multiple imaging data, say one CT scan, one MRI, one X-ray from the patient. If you feed more than one modality to your models, then your final models are going to be probably more robust, right? So this concept of multimodal or fusion training is something quite fancy in today's machine learning. People are almost always interested in doing that. And if you have the data for it, this is very important. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when we reach the part that I introduced that comes to you, because sometimes I mean, some of these you know, tabular data, some of these clinical variables are pretty easy to obtain, but we should not forget about those. Thank you. Right, so let me quickly jump to the second application, and that is the concept of regression. Now, regression, uh, you probably remember from Alex's presentation on tabular data that, you know, whenever we are going through a regression machine learning problem, we want to predict the values for some quantitative variables, right? So, for example, you know, you, you put uh, some uh, image, uh, so, some data regarding a patient's weight, uh, you know, sex, uh, uh, you know, lab values, things like that, and just imagine the previous scenario we talked about, but without the imaging, and you want to understand uh, how much, uh, you know, how many days the patient will survive, something like that. So this would be a regression problem. But when you talk about medical imaging, you will not see too many instances of regression applications. We do have some of those out there, but they are not as common as classification or other applications that we are going to talk about. One of the most common things that I remember uh, Dr. Erickson and a few of us talked about months ago in the lab was to predict, you know, uh, predict age, looking at different parts of the bodies, for example, looking at brain CT scans, brain MRIs, or maybe lung CT scans, things like that. So if you train a model that receives some sort of medical imaging as input and then try to predict the age of the patient, this could be a regression model. And you see, if you see this pay example paper that I put for you here, you could also you know, visualize how good your model is actually performing by contrasting the chronological age, the real age of the patients versus their predicted ages that were actually guessed by the model looking at the imaging data. But as I said, this is not something quite common. So if you want to annotate uh, for this kind of machine learning application, again, you need to either uh, you know, look at your, I mean, ask your experts to look at the medical imaging data and provide labels to you. But most of the times for regression, we usually have the numbers uh, as a clinical variable, you know, saved somewhere out there. For example, the age of the patients is quite obvious looking at their medical record or even their diacoms. So this is the second application that uh, we talked about. The third one is actually image segmentation. This is quite common, even, you know, sometimes more common than image classification. So you will see a lot of examples from image segmentation if you go through the literature of machine learning applied to medical imaging. So image segmentation, uh, you know, in brief means to identifying pixels of interest in an image. So this is one of uh, our own papers here at OSAIL. Uh, and if you look at that, you will see that we wanted to, you know, try to uh, somehow segment these ischial tuberosities on these pelvis X-rays and also the cup of the implant put there. So these are total hip arthroplasty patients, those patients that need to go through some sort of joint replacement operations. And they have these kind of artificial implants in their body. So we wanted to recognize, or better to say, to uh, identify those pixels that belong to a specific areas that we were interested in. And to do so using a machine learning model is going to be called medical, I mean, image segmentation or semantic segmentation. Now, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, applications for segmentation. Sometimes people use that for localizing a lesion, for example, a tumor in some medical imaging. You know, suppose that you uh, give a brain MRI to your model and you wanted to quickly understand the, the exact or accurate boundary of the 
brain tumor, glioblastoma, there, for example. So these uh, kind of applications are usually possible using image segmentation models. Sometimes we want to estimate the volume of a lesion. And again, if you want to do that, you definitely need to train a segmentation model to accurately tell you the number of pixels that actually belonged to that class of interest for you. And then you could do some sort of programming mathematical operations to understand the volume of that area for yourself. Or uh, as we did in this project, sometimes image segmentation is the baseline for you know, some sort of and further image processing algorithms. Now, the kind of image processing that we did in this project and image processing uh, you know, doesn't need to be done using AI. For example, in this project, it was pure Python code without any kind of machine learning there. The machine learning step actually happened earlier. So we fed a pelvis X-ray like this to our models. We received a segmentation mask like this one. So we did know what pixels actually belong to skeletal porosities or to the you know, cup of the implant here and all other pixels were zero. And then we did some sort of image processing on that to draw these lines that you see here and finally measure these angles that these green and red lines build with each other. We were interested actually in this kind of acetabular angles for some sort of orthopedic application. So sometimes people uh, you know, combine segmentation with further image processing. So medical image segmentation, a lot of time is actually one component of the pipeline, not the entire pipeline for itself. So it is good to have this in mind. Now, the important note here is that Annotation for this actually takes a lot of time, right? So uh, medical image segmentation is one of those applications that you need to spend a lot of time for annotating. Uh, one or two people at least need to go through that. They, we have a specific software that people can use. And basically what they do is that they try to uh, you know, manually segment some of these pelvis x-rays or you know, whatever other image data that you're interested in using mouse. So they basically paint the objects of interest using their mouse. And then when we have a lot of manual annotations, then we feed all those to a machine learning model and machine learning model will hopefully learn how to automatically segment uh, those areas that we care about. So this is called image segmentation. Now, object detection is actually the fourth application. Now, object detection uh, you know, is somehow similar to uh, medical image segment Segmentation, but to be honest, lead, I mean, less accurate. So the, the intention of object detection is that we are going to localize objects of interest, but we are not going to care about individual pixels. We only want to understand, or better to say, to estimate the rough area for an object or tissue or lesion of interest. Now, for example, in this study that you see on the right, and this was, again, one of our own publications, we cared about understanding uh, the, you know, estimated location of the head of the implant, right? We didn't care about the exact location, but we wanted to crop the images, to be honest. We wanted to use these uh, some sort of areas in order to crop the images. And then if you're interested, feed those cropped images to a second machine learning model to do a classification. So basically object detection could also be put together with other type of algorithms to be a pipeline. But uh, you know, the object detection itself, the only thing it did for us was that it uh, actually denoted these red rectangles for us saying that, you know, this is probably the area that you are interested in. So it helped us to focus on that, that area that we wanted. So if you, if you note here, it has not segmented the implant for us or any bone for us. We do not know the pixel value for anything here, but we do know the rough predicted area for some sort of objects or tissue that we were interested in. So this is called object detection. Now you might ask, why do we need object detection at all if it is less accurate than a medical image segmentation algorithm? And the answer is that, as I told you, annotation for segmentation is going to be too much expensive. And you know, annotating for this one is going far, be, far easier. So I have done both. If you want to annotate uh, data for an object detection model, you just need to go through a software again, but this time, instead of painting every single pixel by yourself, you are just going to draw a rectangle around that. And this is going to be quite easy, right? So. Uh, this is a quite good question to ask yourself. If you're interested in localizing an object, do you really care about the values of individual pixels or not? If you do, then you probably need to proceed with a segmentation model. If you do not, then maybe an object detection is going to be a more feasible approach for you. And finally, I would like to talk about image generation, which is actually the final, or better to say the final important application of, medical, of machine learning applied to medical imaging. Now, image generation is actually my own interest. It is something quiet, exciting to talk about. So you know that these machine learning models are very powerful and they can even generate images that do not exist for us. So 
Uh, I once tried that and it failed, so I'm not going to show you right now, but if you are not on uh, Mayo intranet or Mayo network, just try to Google this face does not exist and open that. Uh, there is a website there and there is a button. The website is quite easy. There is a button there. You just press generate and you will see a complete realistic image of a person's face. But to be honest, that person does not exist. So that image was quite synthetic built using a machine learning model. So this kind of image generation models are quite popular and exciting in world of machine learning. The most important uh, or the most famous architecture used for image generation that you will probably hear a lot about if you're interested in such topics is GANs or you know uh, generative adversarial networks. So if the, the architecture itself is not that much important for now, but if you are interested in that, just search GAN keyword and put some sort of medical uh, keywords that you are interested in in addition to that and go through Google and see what you will find. Now, image generation in medicine could be used for a lot of purposes. For example, we could use that for data set creation. You know that machine learning almost always needs a lot of data, specifically if you are working with deep learning. So the problem that many researchers have is that you know we do not have too many medical imaging data or you know other type of modalities available to us. So sometimes people use these kind of generation models to create synthetic data set for themselves. Suppose that I have 10,000 pelvis x-rays, but I need millions. What can I do? One strategy could be to train a GAN or an image generation machine learning model to create more pelvis x-rays for you. Of course, the value of those synthetic x-rays for the model is not going to be uh, similar to the original you know, real x-rays that you could have found, but this is going to be a still super useful. We could also use that for noise reduction. So for example, if you look at these, uh, you know, uh, two images on the right side, some GANs have been used for motion correction in MRI. So artifacts actually had been removed from this pay input uh, MRI using some sort of artificial neural networks here. And we could also use that for less imaging time or exposure. So one thing that we can do is that we can probably pick a PET scan here and then try to apply a, a machine learning model to that to generate a CT scan, quite similar to that cut that we were looking at its PET or an MRI for the same cut. So this is quite something fancy. Uh, many of the colleagues in our lab have already done this. In Dr. Rickson's lab, we had colleagues who actually created a model that could that was able to convert a T1 to T2 MRI. And we also have uh, you know, amazing colleagues who could actually uh, achieve uh, making, uh, increasing the resolution of some sort of 3D imaging data like CT scans or MRI. So there are a lot of applications for that. Just feel free to search for that. And image generation is something that uh, is uh, actually uh, uh, getting more and more attention these days. So that was the end of part aim one, part one to be to say. We went through some sort of application. And I would like to pause here and give you some time to ask your questions or hear your comments if you're interested in sharing anything with everybody. No questions? Perfect. So this is good news as we can have more time for AIM-3, which I was personally more interested in. But let's proceed to AIM-2, which is now uh, about medical imaging data itself. So you probably have now a general understanding of what is going to happen in the world of machine learning when we apply that to medical imaging data. But let's talk about the second component now. What is medical imaging data, right? So before we uh, go through this process, uh, it's good to remind you of this life cycle of a machine learning project that we went through in our first workshop. You do remember the different steps that we needed to go through whenever we wanted to run a machine learning project. And in this specific aim, I am going to talk about three steps here, resource collection, data exploration, and data handling. So whatever slides that we are going to review with each other belongs to these three steps of the you know, general pipeline that we had put together. So let's talk about first 2D versus 3D medical imaging data. You probably all know about this before, but only as a quick recap. So in medical imaging world, we have many different types of imaging available to us. We have some imaging, for example, that dermatologists work on, and they look like you know natural images, at least are much closer to natural images than radiology images. They have these images of uh, skin, and you see that those are colorful images that could be quite similar to other natural images like you know nature images and things like that. But we also have 2D radiology images, which almost all the time may mean x-rays. 
Uh, and then we also have pathology slices that, you know, again, uh, pathology, pathology to work on and, you know, AI and machine learning has actually advanced a lot uh, in both radiology and pathology. So you will probably see a lot of applications of that already published in the literature. But uh, as opposed to this 2D uh, type of data, we also have 3D data available to us. And as I told you, this is where uh, the term computer vision might be a little bit tricky to apply to you know, machine learning for medical imaging, because we do have CT scans, MRIs, and this kind of 3D data. I know that they are originally built of uh, you know, some 2D data that are stacked on top of each other, but you know, we can actually generate 3D rendering out of those, like this 3D rendering of pelvis bone here. And this means that we are somehow dealing with 3D data, right? So, and we can actually obtain more than one 2D view of, for example, sagittal view, coronal view, axial view. So we do have access to a kind of medical imaging, to a kind of imaging data that is somehow different than those you know, non-medically oriented engineers work on in my real machine learning world. So we need to be careful about this data. And this is actually what makes uh, imaging data and machine learning quite interesting. Now, Another topic that I would like to introduce to you, again, some of you might already be familiar with, is the definition of DICOMs and their application. So DICOMs uh, are actually a specific type of data and also a protocol for data transfer. So you know that most of the radiology images, you know, uh, I can't even dare and say all of those, and some of the pathology images are stored in a special file formats called Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine, which is abbreviated as DICOM, right? Now, DICOM files end in DCM extension. You might have already seen those. Sometimes you download them from different databases or data sets. So whenever you saw a file that ends in DCM, it's probably a DICOM file. But it's important to know that uh, you know uh, when you go through, for example, a CT scan or an MRI, uh, it doesn't mean that that CT scan or MRI is going to be saved only on one DICOM file. We usually store X-rays or 2D medical imaging data on one DICOM file, so one X-ray could be, I mean, one DICOM could belong to one X-ray. But when we talk about 3D images, like CT scans, MRIs, uh, so those usually are stored in multiple DICOM files, right? So for example, if a CT scan has, I don't know, 20 cuts, 20 axial cuts, then you probably are going to see 20 DICOM files associated with that single study, right? So there are, uh, there are ways, there are attributes in DICOM files that make it possible for PAC system and also for those who are interested in working with DICOMs directly to understand which DICOMs actually uh, belong to each other. For example, they form the same CT scan. We do have uh, you know, strategies to recognize those DICOMs, but for the purpose of this presentation, it's only important to know that DICOM, I mean, one study, one CT or MRI study could go to multiple DICOMs. And the second important point is that uh, DICOM is a tricky term because it not only denotes a file format, but also denotes a standard protocol for medical imaging transfer. And this is important to know because, you know, DICOMs are the magic behind all these different uh, PAC systems that come from different vendors, but they are capable of uh, opening, you know, uh, all radiology images or some pathology images, regardless of where the patient has actually uh, gone through imaging, right? So I can go through an imaging here at Mayo and then my DICOM files could be easily read in another country because this is a kind of protocol for data transfer. PAC systems, all PAC systems know how to read DICOM files and how to convert those to real images that specialists could, could look at when going uh, through them in PAC systems or DICOM viewers. Now, uh, the final important point, and this is what actually makes DICOM quite interesting, is that DICOM files store non-imaging data in addition to the imaging data that they include. So this is important. So if you have a DICOM file that belongs to a chest X-ray from a patient, that DICOM file includes some other information, some other data rather than the imaging itself. It does have the imaging, but it also has some other kind of variables in that, which are usually uh, you know, uh, coded as a small text there. So what kind of variables, I mean, uh, can we find in DICOM files rather than the imaging itself? So the two important categories are one, the patient information. For example, you will find patient name, patient age, sex, you know, referring physician, whatever data that uh, might be recorded there. And this is not something consistent. Sometimes different institutes have different protocols for what to put in DICOM form files. 
Uh, and then we also will find some additional information or additional data regarding the imaging as well. For example, uh, you know, we, we understand the range of the pixel values. We can understand something like the resolution. We can understand the slice number if the DICOM, for example, belongs to a CT scan. And as I told you, there are also attributes there that will help us to understand if this DICOM, for example, is the fifth axial slice from a CT scan with 20 slices. You know, if I look at one DICOM file from a CT scan, I can easily understand this. How many slices were there in total? And which specific slice is this DICOM talking about, right? So these are the kind of uh, data that is actually also stored in DICOM files in addition to the imaging data. So this is important to keep in mind. Now, uh, as you probably can guess, we do have a lot of DICOM viewer software and those are designed to show images embedded in DICOMs as well as their metadata tags, right? So if you go through some of this software, you are going to see the patient's name. You are also going to see their imaging, for example, MR, CT, X-ray, and a lot of other things that are stored in DICOMs could also be used. And definitely the software use some of those imaging and metadata attributes that DICOMs store to visualize these images to you in a way that you find appropriate, right? And, and we have a lot of DICOM viewer software. Some of them are at enterprise level, you know, QReads, Visage, these are, those are the ones that, you know, radiologists here use. You probably have used them before. And we do have some sort of free or out of charge uh, open source tools available to us that most of the times data scientists are more interested to work with because they could also be used for image annotation, for example. And uh, the most famous one, if you want to explore them, are ITK, Snap, uh, Horos, which, has a, which I believe is for Max, and we do have 3D Slicer, uh, real contours. So there are different types of those available. If you are in interested, just search for them. I will find a lot. Uh, tools and functionality definitely vary between these tools. Some offer annotation tools, as I said. And you know, some software also have abilities to deploy machine learning models. So this is important, right? Uh, you, might, uh, you might wonder if I train a machine learning model that could be applied to medical imaging data, then how am I going to use that in real practice, right? So this is, this is an important question to ask. And this actually uh, is related to a very important area in machine learning that is called deployment or deployment of machine learning models. And in medical imaging world, this is also quite important because we already have a very established DICOM viewer software in each institute. So we need to find a way to add machine learning models to those software. And some of the software fortunately provide capabilities for that. So for example, at Mayo, we have tools and some models are already deployed that year. So we do have tools that can, for example, uh, you know, uh, receive a CT, input CT the scan, and then, for example, you know, segment different organs in that CT scan for the radiologist. If that radiologist, when reviewing the packs, just pushes a button, right? So this is going to be super easy if those models are actually implemented within these viewers. So this is uh, the concept of DICOM viewer software. And now I'm going also to talk about imaging data sets. And this is, again, something that you need to be aware if you are uh, going to work with machine learning models because you do need to collect some data and data usually comes from imaging data sets. Now we do have two types of data sets here, right? We have private data sets and public data sets and some things are different between these two kinds of categories. Now talking about access, private data sets, say for example, the medic medical imaging data sets that we have available at Mayo, they are usually uh, you know, limited to people working at that specific institute, right? So for example, people out of Mayo could not easily access our data. They need to purchase that or they need to sign contracts with us, MOU with us, and then maybe they will be provided with some sort of access. But when talking about public imaging data sets, you can you know, almost always uh, easily find access to them. You probably need to sign some sort of consents, but those consents are free. Everything usually can be done in less in a few minutes, and then you will be provided the link to download that uh, a specific data set for yourself. Uh, again, private data sets, sometimes, or better to say, usually are small. Of course, it depends on the institute. Whenever we, we are, I don't know, if you are talking about an institute as big as Mayo, even the private data sets are going to be much bigger than some of the public data sets out there. But for most of the institutes that are average size or smaller, uh, private data sets might not be that much big. Uh, but public data sets, they are usually big. The reason is that if you are publishing a data set and if you want other people to pay attention to what you have released, you want it to be big, right? Because no, there, there are definitely values in even you know, releasing a small data set, smaller data sets, but people usually tend to release bigger data sets, you know, containing images from a lot of patients and even sometimes from more than one institute. So some institutes sometimes come together, sign contracts, and then release uh, a pool data sets from uh, images coming from different patients, right? And finally, uh, 
the data coming from private data sets is most of the time identifiable, right? So these are not the identifiers. So you probably need to be careful with that. Uh, as you remember, Diacom files store a lot of patient information, patient data. So if you are working with that, either you need to be quite careful with, you know, uh, where you are putting those data sets, uh, where you are uploading them, those data, that data should not be uploaded to anywhere out of the Institute. Or if even you have the permission to do so, you need to de-identify the private data set first. So this is something quite important. And uh, it's, it's worth noting that even de-identifying some private data doesn't necessarily mean that you have the permission to share that with everybody else, right? So be careful about what you do with private data sets. But when talking about public data sets, most of the time, almost all, all the time, they can't be identified. So usually you do not have to worry about uh, the, the identification process. The very high quality data sets, they de identify the DICOMs directly. Uh, and this is a better approach because if you de identify the DICOM, you are still going to provide DICOMs to data scientists, which basically means that data scientists are going to have access to some of the data that were not considered sensitive, but it still could be useful for training models. For example, in the example that we talked about, if we are training, for example, a machine learning model on COVID 19 patient x rays, uh, it's good to have the age or sex of those patients. And, you know, these are not something quite sensitive to usually blind, I mean, to blind them. So if uh, you de-identify your diacoms, but they still keep those two fields in the diacoms, then maybe data scientists could come up with uh, more robust models. But uh, unfortunately, the more public, uh, the, more, the more common approach is that if people want to de-identify the diacoms, they just simply get the imaging data out of that, which basically means that uh, they will destroy the diacom and only give you the, a stored image in that diacom as a PNG image or as a JPEG image, which basically means that you are not going to be uh, uh, able of accessing the other metadata in those diacoms, original diacoms. Now, talking about public data sets, uh, I guess I also introduced this paper before, but it's worth mentioning again. We have a very nice paper here, a systemic collection of medical image data sets for deep learning. Uh, this is not very recent, but it's still very useful. So whenever I care about a project, whenever I want to think about a project, uh, almost the first step I do is that I go and check this paper and then I also Google that to understand if there is any kind of public data sets already out there, even though I might have access to very big private data sets, you know that uh, it will never hurt expanding your data set and also uh, moving some uh, you know, external kind of images to your data sets because this is going to be super useful both for training and also validating your model. So, uh, and I have put a kind of interesting chart here. So at the time of publishing this paper, you can see the distribution of available public medical imaging data sets. For example, 2% of that belong to uh, breast. If you look at that, the majority of the release data actually belongs to brain. So we have a lot of brain MRI, brain CT scans. Uh, published uh, on a release publicly, but we do all, we do have, for example, five percentage of bone, which uh, we usually care about at ortho and other things here. And lungs, definitely, of course, I believe uh, some of these percentages uh, are there thanks to COVID. But anyway, so it's good to take a look at this chart. Now, I would like to talk about another concept that uh, I learned its name from Dr. Erickson once, uh, and this is the problem of Frankenstein data sets. And this is something very fancy. It, Dr. Erickson and a few of us also talked about this in a review paper that we recently submitted to Radiology AI talking about, you know, the, the best practice of data handling for machine learning projects. This is something that actually happened to a lot of COVID publications uh, in less than a year ago, right? The problem is that, so you probably remember from our previous two workshops that whenever we want to go through machine learning training, we want to uh, separate or split our data to some folds that are, or to some sets that are clearly separate from each other. And by this, I mean that no patient overlap should be between those sets. If I'm going to train my model on a fraction of data I have, and then validate that on a separate fraction of my data, we do want these two fractions to have nothing in common. And the best practice in medical world is that we usually provide separate patient IDs to these two sets. So there is no patient overlap there. Now, at the time that COVID happened, everybody was craving for data. They wanted big and big data sets, right? And some institutes uh, did a good job there and released their data. Even some individual patients, some individual data scientists released data on their GitHub pages. Now, the problem that happened was that some of the people who were there and they, you know, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, they, they said that, you know, I am going to release the biggest data set ever. And what they did was that they downloaded the data 
from whatever other repositories or data sets that were already available in the internet. And then they renamed the files and then they added some images from their own and re-uploaded the all, entire data set. And of course the uploaded data set could be bigger than whatever else that could be there. But I, as a data scientist, could have gone there and say that, oh, this is data set X, which was older. And this is data set Y, which has been recently published and includes a lot of images. So let's get both of them. And I will make this assumption that the patients between these two data sets are quite separate from each other. I'm going to, for example, train my model on one of those and then validate that in another one. And to be honest, what will happen is that if that Y data set, Y big data set had been made of some of these patients that had already been in the X data set, then my S split is going to be a mess. And this happened to me personally, that Eric probably remembers that on those times that we didn't have too many COVID cases at Mayo, we were doing our best to go through some of these public data sets and train a model. And I had a model that actually looked to work quite nicely on my training and validation set. And that, that was quite interesting. We had the scores that were close to 99% of accuracy for detecting COVID or distinguishing that from other pneumonias. But when we got some Mayo data that we were sure that those were not included in my data, in my original data training data, my model was doing a very poor job there. And, and we were quite confused. We didn't know what has happened and till the time that we came out to this problem and we realized that, oh, some of the training data sets that we used had actually some images uh, in common with each other. So be super careful with Frankenstein data sets. Basically, you need to clearly know what patients have been, I mean, what patient data have been used for the public data set that you're interested in, right? And this is something that uh, a few months ago, a lot of people talked about, you know, accusing these uh, data scientists that published paper after paper saying that, you know, our COVID-19 models achieved accuracy of 99.9999. You say, oh, well, believe me, this is probably something wrong, right? Now, again, I would like to remember, I have to remind you of the concept of fair public data should be findable, interoperable, accessible, and reusable. And, you know, this, this probably now makes more sense to you talking about Frankenstein data sets. So be careful about working with public data that is fair and if you are own, um, if you are yourself thinking of releasing some data release it in a fair manner now i believe this is the last slide for this aim so i'm going to talk about some sort of natural image data sets as well we are in the world of medicine and we do care about medical imaging data sets and there are many medical imaging data sets already published but it is worth noting that uh, in real computer vision world, non-medical computer vision world, people usually talk about a lot of natural image data sets as well. And the most famous one is this image that, that I have put for you here. This is actually the most famous, the most basic, and the most, uh, I, I believe the new version of that, even the biggest data set that we have, the biggest public data set that we have in the field of computer vision. Uh, it consists of 14 million images from 1,000 different categories. I believe the new version of that also has 22,000 categories. But, you know, the images are like the ones that you see here. Those are not medical. Those are images of people, cars, uh, you know, plants, things like that. And this data set is quite important because it is used for benchmarking the performance of new neural network architectures. What that means is that if I'm a data scientist and I came up with a new neural network that I believe is going to be the state of the, state of the art better than whatever else, I am going to prove that by applying, by training my new model on the publicly available ImageNet data set and then release the performance metrics for that, right? And then these performance metrics could be used, could be compared with other training pipelines, other neural networks that have already been there. So this is a kind of, uh, baseline benchmarking uh, routine whenever the data scientists come up with some new models or new training techniques, whatever, right? So it's good to know that. And uh, another thing that I would like to talk about this uh, later, but I would like to briefly mention here is that this natural image data set of ImageNet is also going to be useful for us as data scientists who work on medical imaging because of the transfer learning. Now that term transfer learning, you probably already know about, but if not, uh, keep that in your mind. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, in third part of this presentation. Now, pre-pre medical imaging for ML development seems that I lied and that was not my last slide for this part, but it's probably one of the last. So whenever we are going to prepare medical imaging data for ML development, we are going to go through two main processes. The first one is called data analysis, or if you want the technical term, it's usually called the exploratory data analysis. People, data scientists usually call it EDA. EDA basically means that to look at your data and try to interpret that as much as you can, right? 
try to understand, try to realize the data size and the data distribution. If your data has, uh, has come from multiple institutes or multiple cohorts of patients, try to understand how many, uh, how many patients from each cohort exist in your data. Or you know, if they have different attributes, try to visualize those attributes, try to look at the data types and file extensions. All, are, are all your files in the ICOM format or are some of them in JPEG format or do you have both of those types available to you? What are the image qualities? Visualize the data by yourself. Of course, if the data set is too big, you cannot visualize each individual image, but pay attention to a random subset of your image data set and you know, understand the quality and artifact. You know, Do you have, do those images look to you as they should have looked when you first started the project or do you have some noise there, some artifacts that you need to remove? What is happening in your data, right? Heterogeneity in image source is also another thing that you need to consider and any source of bias. You know, this, this is not something that I can provide you with a specific list of items. You need to look at your data and then keep asking yourself questions and questions about what could go wrong with this data if I train a model on that. And then probably at the end of an EDA, you have some notion of how to clean your data or what kind of noise data to get rid of. And this basically brings you to the next phase that is called data cleaning. And data cleaning, as we all know, is actually to get rid of the noisy low quality data or remove the unwanted data. Maybe the data is not low quality or noisy, but you really do not care about that, right? You don't want it. You know that you are sure that if you keep that data, you are just going to make your model more confused. So let's get rid of that data. Um, and you know, maybe some people consider annotation separate from data cleaning. Some say that annotation should also happen during the data cleaning. Otherwise, data annotation is something that you need to do after you clean your data, right? So this, uh, this is important to keep in mind. Uh, so never ever annotate an unclean data set because you might spend a lot of time on annotation and then realize that part of your annotations are going to be useless because the original images need to be removed during data cleaning. And annotating medical imaging data for ML training, we already, uh, we already talked about that. So I just put this slide here as kind of a review. I told you that it takes time and effort. Some software exists for that. Again, the names are here for you if you want to think about downloading those. Real country, right? Okay, Snap, 3D Slicer, they are the free ones. Label Me is actually specifically for annotating object detection, those red boxes, if you remember. So this is actually one of the software that I like because it usually takes a lot of time. I mean, much less time than me than, for example, the other ones here that are for segmentation. Uh, all right. So, uh, one point here is that sometimes automated or semi-automated annotation is also possible. So if you have a very hard job annotating something, it's worth consulting someone who has experience with data science to understand if there are ways to semi-automate at least your annotation pipeline, which basically means that we are going to use some sort of already trained uh, machine learning models to help you with annotation. Those machine learning models might not do a very accurate job, and this is the reason that we still need you as the annotator, but those might uh, make your work, make your better and less. So it's good to have this point in mind that sometimes machine learning could also be useful for the annotation itself. And again, I'm not sure if I wrote this here or not, but sometimes those public imaging data sets that we talked about, they also re release annotations, right? So for example, they might release classification annotations, segmentation annotations. So almost always you should look for public data first. If you have some public GORSI data available, then uh, good for you. You probably are going to have less time spent on annotation by yourself. And this is the final slide of this point. This is an example of a medical imaging annotation software. Uh, I believe that was, I guess, 3D Slicer. So uh, you just feed in your images here, and then it provides you with all these nice tools for painting your images, as this is for a segmentation. You see here, some people have gone through a 3D volume here, try to segment each organ, and you can imagine how, how much time this, this probably has uh, taken from them. But you know, if you fit this to a machine learning model and train that decently, then you probably have a model that can segment all organs this much beautifully for you. So annotation almost always pays off at the end of the day. Perfect. Now we are at the end of checkpoint two. So again, I would like to pause, see if anybody has questions or comments. Uh, maybe uh, because I have to leave at two uh, p.m. Maybe I ask a question. Sure. Uh, the uh, the question about the computer uh, vision, the first part, and yes. the, I was just thinking, you know, in the practice right now is, you know, in the orthopedic field, for example, you have a tumor or let's say you have a spine problem. 
So you let the patient take a CT or MRI, get the imaging, right? Yep. And then um, the radiologist would look at uh, the information you provided by the physician, and then based on the imaging, they make a suggested diagnosis and mm -hmm. back to physician. Yes. So we always kind of caution for the physician is the imaging is uh, is not like a, uh, uh, let's say this way, the imaging data is not, uh, uh, you cannot diagnose some problem just purely based on the imaging analysis. So for example, make the a good example, the spine. You know, a lot of the spine disorders, uh, degeneration, stenosis, you know, some patient very worse, very bad uh, imaging, but they, um, the combined the clinical uh, symptom or uh, uh, the checking, uh, they cannot establish a diagnosis based on the imaging. So the, my question is uh, for this uh, AI or machine, machine learning or deep learning, how they can uh, change the practice with the uh, with the physician uh, physician uh, the uh, whatever the clinical symptom involved, even you know imaging uh, by this uh, machine learning show okay this is a show the myelopathy for example that's kind of worse the spine problem, and then back to physician okay the patient doesn't have any nerve problem so myelopathy cannot be established. Is that the AI can help for this? Yep. So thank you for your question. This is quite an interesting one and maybe something that uh, a more experienced researcher and data scientist like Dr. Erickson can provide better answers than me. But in my humble eyes, uh, the answer to your question is that it is possible doing that using machine learning. And to be honest, this is something that we all aim for whenever we train models using machine learning. We do not want to have tools that are only fancy enough to be, you know, to, to maneuver on in presentations. And then in real practice, we cannot rely on those. But uh, training those kind of models that we can really trust in, mach in, in real clinical practice, specifically for those kind of hard examples you mentioned is something that takes a lot of time and iteration. So fortunately, we have good examples of those already available. And to be honest, uh, I, I believe uh, in our own labs, both in Dr. Erickson's lab and in Dr. Kramer's lab, we, we actually uh, published a lot of those. So for example, uh, one, of the, one of the most recent papers that I can uh, you know, uh, tell you as an example that we recently submitted to Radiology AI, uh, is from my colleague, Dr. Khosravi, who, who, who basically, he designed a risk calculator for patients that went, that, that are going through total hip arthroplasty. And that risk calculator is meant to tell the operating surgeon what risk that patient is going to have for this location, uh, or, you know, the implant dislocation, I mean, <clears throat> sorry, depending on uh, some of the, you know, unchangeable attributes of the patient, uh, like their age, like their sex, or even their preoperative x-ray. And also some of the decisions that the surgeon is going to make, like the type of implant is going to use, he or she is going to use, right? Things like that. So the final, the final application or the final software is actually uh, a very nice graphical interface that a surgeon should upload a single preoperative pelvis x-ray of the patient to, and then enter, for example, the age, the sex, and things like that. And then the model is going to make some sort of calculations. And then finally, it is going to provide some sort of risk estimation to the surgeon that, for example, if you want to operate on this patient using this specific implant, they are going to have this much of this, this amount of risk for this location in the front, right? Something like that. So this is, this is an example of a model that hopefully could be put into practice finally if, if and this probably is going to help a lot to individualize with medicine right because you now can adjust your decisions as a physician based on some features or some uh, you know clinical attributes of your patient that you might not already be aware of and this is what machine learning model actually cared about because in that a specific example i told you barrier's model actually relied a lot on that single pelvis image that the physician provided to the model. And it is quite interesting because we have a lot of publications on 20 or 30 clinical variables saying that, you know, we can predict the risk of dislocation looking at these clinical variables that are all 
you know, beautifully described in Excel spreadsheets. But what Bardia showed in his work was that a single pelvis X-ray, a single preoperative X-ray could be, uh, you know, uh, I can dare to say that more valuable that many of those many of those clinical variables collectively. Of course, we combine those together. We are not going to lose any data. We are not going to focus on or you know, be biased towards any modality. But I want to say that sometimes if carefully engineered, these machine learning models could be as accurate as you describe them or be used for real practice. Thanks, great, great talk. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Perfect. So now I'm going to talk about machine learning algorithms for medical imaging data. And this is where things get a little bit more technical. So I try to present uh, more slowly and also pause more often to give you time to ask your questions. And then also I'm going to do a lot of recaps, right? So this, the first seven or eight slides of this part is going to be recaps of our two previous workshops, because I believe this is something that you might not, uh, you, you might need to know about before we talk about convolutions, right? So let's start by reviewing this uh, big picture chart first. So we are going to talk about model development. This entire part three is regarding is uh, about model development. We might also talk about model validation in some of the recaps, but convolutional neural networks are actually a kind of architecture that we care about when we are developing our models. Now let's start with machine learning models in general. So you probably remember that we first introduced machine learning models and specifically deep learning models as some mathematical equations, right? Which I told you that, you know, whenever you talk about deep learning models or neural network, you can naively imagine them as a very, very big uh, mathematical equation that receives some inputs and then does some sort of operations with those inputs. For example, it, apply, it multiplies the values received from you to some sort of parameters, add them with some other parameters, and then finally generates some sort of output for you. So that generated output could be a single number, for example, denoting the risk of this location, or could be a single number, either zero or one, saying that this patient has COVID or has not, or it could be a complete image in image generation models, right? So those outputs do not need necessarily to be one uh, single value. This could be a lot of values, even a very large set of values as an image itself, right? So, but the, the concept is going to stay the same. Whenever we talk about deep learning and machine learning, we are going to talk about a big equation. And when we talk about training a model or fitting a model, we usually mean to find, or we want to find the best set of parameters. Uh, people also talk about them as weights and biases for that specific equation, which basically means that we are looking for those parameters of our equation that if, for example, we provide it with uh, a picture like this or a picture like this dog, it is going to accurately say the name of this uh, animal with, uh, inside the picture, right? So this this is going to be the kind of model that we are looking for, a model that receives an image and it is able to distinguish whether or not it is a cat or whether or not it is a dog. And for doing so, we need to change the mathematical values, the uh, you know the uh, the raw values of all these parameters that our model might have. So this is actually called training. Whenever we say that we are training a model, it basically means that we have a neural network or another machine learning model, and now we are going to learn what parameter are going to work best in that specific uh, model for us. So as I told you before, for computer vision applications, we almost always rely on neural networks uh, or deep learning to, deep, to develop machine learning models. Not to say that we do not use conventional machine learning. Of course, conventional machine learning is very valuable. And sometimes the combination of these two work even better than deep learning alone, right? But you no, know, deep learning is almost there, right? It's always there. Even when we talk about map, medical imaging, deep learning should be there most of the times. Okay. now. Again, the second recap is about the terminology of fit in machine learning. And this is a, a slide that I had shown you before. You probably remember that whenever we want to train a machine learning model, we are looking for an appropriate fitting. An appropriate fitting means that our model, first of all, is able to really classify, uh, you know, or to really do the job that we intend it to do. So for example, uh, this is a kind of a classification task. We want to distinguish these circles from this cross signs. And if we have a model that can draw a line like that, 
it is probably distinguishing these two classes from each other. If it does a job like this, it basically means that it has not learned anything, which we usually refer to as underfitting, or right, you know, we, said we probably uh, see these in cases where our models are too, too simple to learn the complexity in our data. For example, you have a very, very small neural network, but you want that neural network to learn something very complicated or to predict something very complicated, right? This is, uh, as I told you, the Archer's Hill of conventional machine learning because those conventional models are not usually as big as deep learning models. So they usually tend to underfeed the data or not always, but they usually tend to do so. And then uh, on the opposite end, we have another unwanted situation that is called overfitting. And this is the Archer's Hill of deep learning models because those are very big. And this, this means that they, they can basically learn to distinguish your two classes like this, which basically means that they have learned the noise in addition to the real signal in your data. And we don't want this to happen, right? Because if a model is doing a job like that, it somehow can be interpreted as this. The model has memorized your data, but has not learned them, right? So you should be very careful with overfitting whenever you are training a deep learning model. There are strategies to overcome overfitting or at least mitigate that, like increasing the size of your training data, reducing the complexity of your model. I'm not going to talk about those in details here. You can easily find a lot of uh, research about that if you just Google it. But for the sake of this presentation, only uh, keep in mind that we are looking for an appropriate fitting. Overfitting and underfitting is something that we do not want to happen. And I'm going to use this concept later on when we talk about convolutional neural networks. Now, the concept of loss, that was something that Alex introduced to you in his last uh, presentation. You probably remember that loss is a measure of how good or a bad a model is performing. And whenever a model is doing it, or better say, the poorer a model's prediction or the poorer a model's performance, the higher its loss, right? So uh, we have functions, mathematical functions called loss functions. And the way they do, the way they operate is not that much complicated. They receive the ground truth labels that we really expected the model to generate for us. For example, this could be the labels that your experts annotated for you. And then the automated labels that the model actually generated, and we compare these two, and the difference between the two is called loss. So for example, look at this image on the right. If we want to have actually uh, find uh, the equation for this blue line, uh, in a way that it can somehow fit this data set, these data points that we have uh, on this kind of page. So if, if we have a model like this, if our line is actually like this, then it means that the, it is not doing a good job. So one way of obtaining a loss value for this model is that we can, for example, get the absolute length of all these red lines, right? And then try to sum that together, you know, or sum the square of those together. And this could be loss. So for example, if we do the same thing here to this second model, you would probably expect a less loss, I mean, a lower loss value, right? Because the, the, the model is actually doing a better job here. So the concept of loss function is something that you should know about. And, uh, you know, machine learning and deep learning models learn through many iterations. So this, this is actually how the training happens, right? We punish deep learning models or machine learning models and make them make the loss lower to reduce the loss. So if the model is actually, I mean, changing its parameters in a way that loss is actually getting higher and higher, then we force the model using the concept of gradients in mathematics. And if you do not know about this or you do not care about this, just forget what I just said, but the magic of deep learning or machine learning usually is depending on gradients and you know differentiation in mathematics. But we force our models to actually reduce this loss value, which basically means that we are forcing them to learn how to do the job for us, how to do what we expect them to do. And so the concept of loss is something that you always see in machine learning publications. Now something, another concept very close to loss, but distinct, uh, I mean, distinguishable than that is the concept of performance metrics, which again are indices of how machine learning models are performing. The only, pro the only difference here is that loss functions should necessarily be differentiable because we want to calculate their gradients with respect to models parameters, but performance metrics do not need to be differentiable. So if you have a metric that, to be honest, uh, it's something that you just came up with. Uh, it works fine, but uh, you do not know, or mathematicians do not know a way to uh, calculate the gradients for that. It's fine. You could still use that as a metric. But if you want to use that as a loss function, you definitely need to know how to calculate the gradients for that. That's the reason that we almost all loss functions could also be used as metrics if they have a real meaning to you. 
as a data scientist, but not all metrics could be used as loss functions. So this is the concept of loss. I would like to pause here and see if uh, someone has questions regarding these first three or four slides. We are only reviewing what we have been gone through. Perfect. Then let's continue. Uh, this is an easier slide. Neural networks have numerous variations in their architectural designs. Uh, this is one of the images that I really love because it shows uh, a lot of architectures. These architectures are quite easy, but to be honest, it somehow reminds me of the world of Lego and how you can build a lot of different architectures using your Lego pieces. So uh, just keep in mind that neural networks are not only one type of mathematical equation. We basically can have as many neural networks as the number of data scientists working in the field because everybody's innovation and creativity could result in a new model or new architecture there, uh, which basically means that to design your equation in a new way. So, and this is the concept of transfer learning that I mentioned earlier, very briefly. You remember that we talked about that very big ImageNet data set that only consisted of you know, natural images. Now, the way that we can use transfer learning is that we do not necessarily need to always start our training with parameters that have random values because you know in a in a very com in a naive training uh, in a standard pipeline when you are training a model your initial parameters are totally random values of course not very random but you know random uh, following a specific distribution but they are still random right so there is a concept there that say that you know if a model was already doing a good job in another task, which might be close to what I have in mind to do with this new model, we probably can take some of the parameters of that first model and use those values as the initial values of our own new parameters in this main new neural network that we are building, right? So this is the concept of transfer learning. We take the parameters from an already trained and already decently working model and put those as the, as the starting values for the parameters of our own models. Of course, there are some limitations there. For example, at least these layers that we are transferring the parameters uh, from and to each other, those should have quite similar architectures. And you know, uh, this is this is something that needs some time for you to understand how to uh, you know optimize your transfer learning pipeline, what weights to update, what weights not to update during the training. But the concept, very simply saying, is exactly what I told you. Now you might say that okay. Uh, does that really help if we uh, transfer learn from a model that had been trained on images like this cat, for example, coming from ImageNet dataset, and then transfer learn from that to models that we want to train, for example, on the CT scan? The answer is very interesting, and it is yes, it sometimes helps. Of course, it's always better if you have a model that has already been trained on CT scans and you know that it was working very good, transfer learn from that. Nobody's going to blame you for that. But if you do not have access to that. What we usually do, and this is our, you know, nowadays baseline practice is that we almost always start our models with parameter values coming from pre-trained models on big data sets like ImageNet. The reason that these models still work uh, is actually the main intention of this part three presentation, convolutions and features that models are going to learn. So keep this point in mind and keep this question in mind. I'm going to return back to this, telling you why these models that have been trained on CAT images might be useful for training new models on CT data or MR data, right? So we're going to talk about them. Now, uh, reminding you of overfitting, transfer learning reduces the need for training data, makes fitting easier and improves models resistance to overfitting, right? So basically it means that, uh, uh, so the general intuition for this uh, is as I tell you now, you are starting your model parameters very close to another model that had an appropriate fit. So you will give more chance to your new model to find an appropriate fit, right? Rather than, uh, you know, leaving it in a very large world of parameter values that it needs to iterate through and learn by itself what values work the best for it, right? So you basically give it a hand in the beginning of the training. And this is just an intuition, right? So behind the scenes, transfer learning uh, actually has mathematical reasons that works better for, uh, you know, combating overfitting. So have this in mind. So rule of thumb, whenever you could do over transfer learning, we always do that, right? This, this is something that uh, we do as a best practice. Now training validation test sets, we talked about this when we introduced Frankenstein data sets. As I said, we want to train our models and then validate those on separate sets. Sometimes even people tend to validate their models 
on sets and then finally test that, I mean, evaluate that at the end of all their iterations on a separate set that is called a test set. Now we have different ways for, uh, you know, dividing our data points between these classes, between these sets. The simplest one is actually the train validation test splitting. Uh, we have fivefold cross validation, and we do have nested cross validation that I learned about two years ago from Dr. Martin Kramers here. So, so basically, there are different types of data set splitting here, and uh, the best ones are usually the ones that uh, you know we have. I mean, nested cross validation is usually the best one to do. Sometimes difficult to implement in real practice, specifically in medical world, because you no, know, uh, if you have 10,000 images, uh, most of the times it's not like that, that these 10,000 images come from 10,000 different patients. Usually each patient has multiple images. And then if you want to split the data to different folds and too many folds, you will uh, face issues like, you know, oh, one of my folds now doesn't have any images from a specific classes, right? So th this is not something always easily implementable, but at least train validation test splitting is something that we all need to do as the least a minimum thing that we need to be careful with when data is splitting. Now, processing medical imaging data for machine learning, right? So now I'm going to talk about the main issues here. A deep learning model or a machine learning model in general expects data, input data to be in format of mathematical values. They expect numbers, they expect quantitative variables. Now, you might ask yourself, how are we going to convert our images, natural images or medical images to numbers? And this is by using the concept of pixel values, right? So for example, if you have this gray scale uh, or you know, black and white image of number eight here, you can imagine that, for example, we have 40 pixels and 20 pixels as height and width of this image. And what we can do is that we can say, we have a 2D matrix with 20 multiplied by 40 elements, so 800 elements here. And this matrix is now going to represent our imaging data, right? So imagine that each element value is going to be between zero, which zero means black, and 255, which this number actually means entirely white. So if you have a value between zero and 255 in this 8-bit image, this basically means that it's going to be some sort of gray for you. And this is how we actually build gray scale or black and white images, right? So most of the imaging type that we deal with in medicine are already black and white or gray scale like x-rays or CTs. So we do have these type of values. And this is super easy, right? The way that we usually feed our models, feed our input data to the models is that we take these matrices out of those images. We say that, okay, this is an image. So let's say, uh, let's convert that. Let's actually get these pixel values out of the DICOMs or out of the JPEG or PNG images and then convert those to matrices that now we can feed to our uh, you know, real machine learning model. So this is the main pre-processing step that we do whenever we want, we want to train a machine learning model on medical imaging. The pre-processing uh, in brief, in general, means that whatever that you are going to do to your data before actually training the model on that data. And the most important component of pre-processing is to convert that data to pixel values or you know these matrices. Is that clear to everyone here? Do you have any questions about this? Fortunately clear, perfect. Now we proceed. Yes, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Question for you. Sure. Uh, we we keep talking about training. Training. Where do you specify your purpose of training? For example, in this case, if you have a set of eight, mm -hmm. assume you have another set of uh, let's say uh, two, yes, uh, image of two. Yes. So you have a stack of uh, a stack of uh, uh, image like this with a bunch of eight with a bunch of two. Yes. So you want uh, your purpose is to try to. Uh, separate them to train them so they'll be able to differentiate eight and two. Yes, so yes. something like this, where do you specify that in your model? So because you, I, I understand, but I kind of get lost in that uh, no, uh, layer one, no layer problem. two, but where yep. do you specify that? Right? Sure. So thank you for this question. Actually, the answer to that lies under this slide. We, I mean, our models train by our punishments, right? If I punish my model, to force them to differentiate a number eight from a number two, then they are going to learn that. If I punish them or if I force them to learn number eight from number seven, they are going to do that. If I force them to differentiate a COVID-19 patient CXR from a normal patient CXR, they're going to do that. And the way we have for punishing our models are 
is summarized in this loss function. So if you're going to train your model for a specific purpose, you are going to have a specific loss function for your purpose. So you feed your input data to the model, and then you have a specific loss function uh, based on your intentions in place that is going to penalize your model for whatever random predictions it makes at the beginning of your training. And over time and after lots of iterations, the model is going to change its parameters in a way that it becomes less penalized, which basically means that it is going to change its parameters in a way that the loss become lower. And again, this means that it is going to change its parameter in a way that it finally learns to do what you wanted it to do. So what we do is that in your example, we get a bunch of eight images and a bunch of two images. Then we have labels for these, right? So we know that each image of coming from two side has a label two, and every I mean each of those images coming from the eight category is also have a label eight, right? Now we'll okay. feed those to those images to the model, and suppose that. Uh, we, we do this one by one. We do not do this uh, one by one in real practice, but let's say we do this one by one. So the first image that goes through is an eight. Now, the real label for this image is eight. Now, suppose that your model randomly predicts that as a two. This basically means that now we have a, an automated, automated predicted value of two and a real value of eight, right? So in this case, I'm just throwing something out of, uh, on top of my head, just very easy. Suppose that you actually... Uh, reduce these two numbers from each other, and then the value is going to be six, and do, and then you make that squared, so that would be 36, and you see that, you know, the loss for this specific example is going to be 36, and then you make, the, so this is the mathematical part, you calculate the gradients of these final loss value, this number 36, right, with respect to all parameters in your model, with respect to all parameters in your model. And you will have some gradient values, one gradient value for each parameter, which is either positive or negative. And those signs, those signs matter because those signs tell your model that if I want to make this 36 lower, now I need to change, for example, each of my positive parameters uh, more to, I mean, I need to lower them, move them more towards zero, and probably I need to move all my negative parameters more, more toward positive side, move them again towards zero. So you change your model parameters based on their gradients that were just calculated based on your loss. And your loss is calculated based on comparing the ground truths and the predicted value from your model. And this way, so this, this was only one iteration for one example. Now imagine this is happening for a lot of examples at the same time, and this is happening for a lot of iterations, right? So at the, at the end of the day, going through all these iterations, one after the other, finally your model parameters would have values that are going to result in that performance you expected the model to have. Okay, so all what you described for a uh, penalty calculation or those can be specified in the model. Oh yes, sure. I oh, mean, I see. Okay. yeah, we, we definitely can specify the kind of gradient operations that we are doing, the loss right. functions that we are providing. What we really cannot do by ourselves, to be honest, is calculating. I mean, we, we provide, we set the scene for the model. We tell them that, you know, you should calculate the gradients like that, the loss function you're going to use is like that, but the calculations themselves are too much heavy for our naive brains, right? Because millions of operations are going to happen in less than a second. And this is not something that our minds can handle. So we, we somehow delegate this part to the model and the computer, but we do know what we are doing and how to set up the training. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Perfect, so let's proceed to the next one. So the same kind of uh, pre-processing or converting of values, uh, you know, images to pixel values could also be true for colorful images or natural images. The only difference is that you probably know uh, colorful images are usually RGB, which basically means that instead of one 2D matrix, they have three 2D matrix. So one for color red, uh, which basically, you know, zero and 255, the range of values there are actually changing the intensity of the red color. Now, one specific matrix for green color and one for blue color. And uh, in data science world, we call these type of images a three channel images. So each channel is actually denoting a matrix, a 2D matrix. So uh, if you're going to consider what type of architecture the uh, pixel values of this image would be that would 
be a tensor. That is the term we use for to denote more generalizable matrices, but you can easily replace that with matrix again. So this is a tensor or a matrix that has shape three multiplied by whatever height we have here and whatever width we have here, right? So for example, if this is 20, uh, 20 pixels in the height and 40 pixels in the width, then the entire number of uh, the entire number of elements we have here are going to be three multiplied by 40 multiplied by 20, right? So this is going to be a three-channel tensor or a three-channel or a three-dimensional matrix, if you want to say that a little bit better. So this is how we convert uh, natural images to, you know, uh, pixel values. As I said. We do not uh, most of the time work with these kind of colorful images. Uh, we do care about channels and the kind of data we put there, uh, but most of the images that we usually work with with our models are grayscale anyway. So, uh, okay, now one more thing before we jump to the concept of convolution is that uh, image pre processing is not limited to pixel quantification or converting your images to pixel values. Uh, maybe I could have put this a slide in a better place, but I just wanted to briefly mention here that, you know, whenever we are training our data, we also do something that is called data augmentation, which basically means that, you know, we try to sell the same images to our model as brand new images. We try to fake them, right? We, we try to uh, play on those models. We, we and the reason that we do that is that, you know, as I told you, these deep learning models need too many data. And the reason they need too many data points is that if your data set is a small, they are quite capable of memorizing your entire data, which is overfitting to your data set, which we do not want, right? So one naive way for combating overfitting is that we increase the number of data points we have in our data set. We expand our data set, which as I told you before, is not always feasible for us because we do not have too many patients in medical image, right? So what we do as an alternative, you already have heard two alternatives from me. One was to create a synthetic data set using those image generation models. We can definitely do that, but that is super, super complicated, a very, a very complete project by itself. Something quite easier we can do is that we can rely on these programming interfaces we have to you know, somehow augment each of our images and fit them to the model as a new image. Of course, the model is not going to consider them as brand new images, you know, as, as valuable as brand new images, but still this data augmentation is going to help our model to learn better. So by augmentation, we can do a lot of things to these images. We can crop them, for example, this is the original image in, the, in this cat is in the middle row is actually the original image. We can crop a part of that image. We can, you know, flip that, we can rotate that, add some noise to it, scale it, you know, change the color, whatever. So, so you see the model is going to still see the same image, but a tweaked version of that. And we hope that by doing this, the model has less chance for overfitting or less chance for memorizing data. So just imagine that, you know, you have a very smart student and you are providing a piece of paper to him. And then you want the student to understand the paper, not to memorize the paper, but they are quite prone to, over, to memorizing that because the student is a smart, but at the same time, lazy. So you just want to make that piece up to make that portion of paper that you give to that student bigger you don't unfortunately have new pages but you can copy the same page flip that rotate that uh, you know put it upside down and tell the patient tell the student that you know this is new data this is new pages right so ultimately the student will understand that this is the old data sold to him in different formats but for, i mean hopefully uh, he will finally realize that I'm going to learn rather than memorize this data. So this is an intuition for data augmentation of these models. Perfect. Now I'm going to now talk about uh, the main business here. So how to feed the pre-processed images to neural networks. So you already heard from me that whenever we have an image from this eight, this, going to, this is going to be converted to this uh, very big matrix of values, all elements between zero and 255. So two questions. What neural network architecture should we use for training a model on this? And this is not even a medical image, a very, very naive 28 by 28 pixel, no medical, uh, natural image or grayscale image. And then the main question is what should be considered as inputs to those neural networks? Should we consider the pixel values or something else? Uh, let's proceed. So. I'm going to first talk about a specific kind of neural network that is the simplest one, 
and that is called multi-layer perceptron neural network, or sometimes they all, they call it fully connected layers or fully connected neural networks. But no, multi-layer perceptron is a more accurate term. And the way that these networks, uh, uh, I mean, work uh, is quite similar to what we went through. So this slide is a repetition from my own slide set in the first workshop. We already know about these things. I'm not going to repeat all the details there. Uh, you do remember that we had some sort of inputs here, three, three values. So this is a quite a simple network, a simple MLP network. We have three input values, x1, x2, x3, but we have a lot of parameters here. So y1, y2, y3, y4, and y5 are all parameters. Uh, I mean, they have parameters. If you see the way that the final value yf is calculated is by going through all these equations one by one. For example, node y1 here has is going to, you know, receive this kind of value here, which is actually made of multiplying different weights, weights from this node, weights from this node, and weights from that node to different input values, and then summing all together, we also had some sort of nonlinear functionalities here. I'm not going, I know that I'm not pausing and, you know, talking in detail about this architecture, but I'm taking this as granted as you probably have watched my previous presentation and know how this works, right? We had examples there and we have spent about 45 minutes on these two images there in two slides there so if you need to uh, remind yourself of the details you can feel free i mean to watch that presentation but anyway so this is a very simple neural network model and you know where as a result of this simple architecture one might say that okay if you're going to train uh, a kind of classifier to say as our previous example classify or distinguish number eight from number two we can say that, all right, we have this matrix of values, and then we are going to consider each of these pixel values as a single input to our model. So you remember, this one, this network here had only three, three input values. Now, we are talking about a very, very big network here that has 784 input values, right? And these values come from only a 28 by 28 pixel, which is quite a small pixel, right? Our you know, normal images that we usually uh, look at and they are high resolution they are 1024 by 1024 so the numbers that could go there are really uh, could be really bigger but even for a 28 by 20 pixels we could fit all of those as input values to a neural network and then train this neural network which had the mlp architecture and hopefully the final value is going to be predicted to be eight so this was actually the baseline neural networks that people came up with and to be honest it worked it worked until a checkpoint that people realize that we should somehow stop working uh, with these MLP models on medical imaging. And I would like to give it a pause here for a couple of minutes. And uh, no, I, I didn't find time to actually create a quiz for that. So put your answers in the chat box, please. What do you think is the downside or are the downsides of using this family of uh, multi-layer perceptual neural networks for imaging data? So what I mean is that feeding each pixel value as an independent uh, I know, input to our model. What could be the problem with this approach? Do you have any guess? If one or two people want to share their answers, I would be happy to hear them. Otherwise, you can also put your answers in the chat box. I'm going to wait for a couple of minutes. Any guess? Was that a difficult question to ask? Dr. Wissendorf says five, options one and two, okay. What else? In fact, there was, it seems that you were the only one who dared to provide an answer. Everybody else is uh, <laughs> doing something else. I guess so. Eight. Omar says eight. All options, okay. Five or, Five or six, Sura. Now we go with some answers here. Okay. Good guesses. I go with five also. Five. All right. Good. And any intuition behind your answers? Does anyone want to share? 
why you think like this. Okay, I consider that as guesses only. All right, so for the sake of time, I would like to proceed here and not take too much of your time, but only looking at this question. So there are two problems, and Dr. Essendorf's answer, to be honest, was true. So there are two problems, two main problems with MLP networks. One is that MLP models can get too big. A previous network, the previous network we uh, take, took a look at only received 28 by 28 image as an input, and it you know, had 784 input variables. So this is something quite, uh, quite heavy for models. And you know, big neural networks, to be honest, are very expensive to train, and they are very prone to overfitting. The reason is that so, so the intuition of this is a little bit difficult to explain, but the intuition is that if, so just imagine as the number of parameters as the size of the brain of that student. If you have a smarter student with a larger brain size, and at the same time, lazy as before, then it means that you need to provide more pages to them to somehow uh, you know, play with them, play tricks on them and say that this is, this is something that you need to learn, right? So the smarter students tend to be more lazy and memorize concepts much, much more than, you know, uh, less a smarter student. So it's good to keep neural networks architecture as small as we need. We need to make them big, but not too much big, because if we make them too much big, then they're going to overfit to our data. Now, the problem with these models is that, as you can see here, this is an example network that has you know, less input variables than 784, but still you can see the number of operations that are going to happen behind the scene and poor computer cannot handle all these. So if you're going to feed in uh, a 1024 by 1024 image to your model, then you can possibly guess what is going to happen, how long it is going to take from the computer to actually predict your final prediction. So basically speaking, we, uh, rarely nowadays work with MLP network. And the reason one for that is that we, we, we understand that these models can get too big if we want to make the input data a little bit complicated, which is actually almost always the case with real data, right? So these models can get very big. Now let's uh, proceed from this fancy animation to another one, right? So we have uh, a second problem with neural network, with MLP neural networks, and this is that, you know, they are sensitive to translation, which basically means that if you change, if you shift, you know, just imagine that you are shifting your entire image one pixel to the right, one pixel to the right. So, or in a more generalizable experiment here, you are changing the location of this number three in your image. Now, an MLP neural network cannot realize that this is the same shape moving in the, in, in the image field. It will say that, oh, even if you move that one pixel to the right or left side or top or bottom, it says that, wow, that, that is a new concept. That is a new class. That is a new tree. MLP neural networks are not capable of understanding. Things can be the same uh, regardless of their actual location in the image. And this is a very huge problem because, you no, know, to be honest, we cannot really regard on these kind of models to do some sort of real work for us. In old days, people tend to pre-process their models a lot. They tend to do a lot of cropping, for example, because this tree was always in the middle of the screen, in the middle of the image. And now when people wanted to really apply a model to realize what number is three or what number is eight, they did a lot of pre-processing to crop the images and put the tree exactly in the middle of the image just for the sake of MLP models not to be confused. And this is a lot of waste of time and energy. So we really didn't want to keep working with these translation invariant, uh, sorry, translation variant or sensitive models. So we really want these models to um, not change their outputs when the position of the objects in the image changes. So uh, we actually rely on these two big problems with MLP networks and then go through another class of neural networks that I'm going to introduce to you, and they are called convolutional neural networks. Now I'm going to go through eight or nine slides one after the other, and this is the last part of the workshop, uh, you know, ignoring that last uh, resources for further understanding that I am going to talk. And this is full of animations. You might have a little bit of difficulty understanding what is happening with the mathematical concept. I try to tell you as simple as possible, but if you didn't understand, it's just a matter of Googling. We have a lot of good examples out there to help you understand, and those are quite uh, written in easy language. 
So let's start with the meaning of convolution itself. So convolution in simple language is a mathematical operation. And the operation is super simple. You have a matrix, you have a smaller matrix, and these smaller matrices are called kernels, right? In deep, in, at least for the purpose of this presentation, you could always regard these kernel matrices to be of size three by three. Right. In real applications, matrices could kernel matrices could have different sizes, but here we can consider them to have only three by three shapes, right? So what you do is that you put this three by three matrix, you overlap, you overlay that on the first part of your image, starting from the top left side of your image, right? You put it there, and you see that I am going to multiply each element of my kernel matrix. Uh, to the same element, to the same position element of my input matrix or image matrix. And the result is going to be my output value the, of the value that I'm going to put in my output matrix. So for example, here, I am going to, oh, oh sorry, uh, I just made, made a mistake there. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to put each of these val values here. So for example, zero by zero, minus one, multiply by zero, this goes to the second range zero multiply by zero, this goes to the third value. And you do this for all the nine values. And what I made a mistake about was that you are not going to add all these intermediate values together, add up them uh, together. So for example, you are going to uh, you know, sum all these nine different values that were made by multiplying element mass per years. And the result is going to be 320. The result is going to be put into this output matrix. So you could see that by applying this three by three matrix on this first three by three placeholder of the image, we are going to have a, a number there. So for this slide, I just want you to understand the meaning of kernel matrix and the convolutional operation. So this is actually a convolution. What we did there was running a convolutional operation, which means that we had a kernel matrix, we applied that on an input matrix and we got an output value. So let's take a look at uh, an animation of that and see how this happens in the future. So this kernel matrix keeps moving onto your original image. So we move that, we shift that, we shift that, we shift that. And we do this till we actually overlay the kernel matrix on the entire regions of the input image. And you see that whenever, I mean, each time that we overlay the kernel matrix, we do the convolutional operation and we get one final output value. And this is how we actually create our output matrix, right? So you can imagine that given an image matrix and a kernel matrix, and forget about the size variability and how they should be matched with each other, forget about that for a second, but you just see that you know an Im image matrix as an input and a kernel matrix as an input can come together to this output matrix that is created, right? This is how the convolutional neural networks are actually work. They are based on this convolutional operation, which is actually a very simple mathematical operation. All right, now, Let's look at this one. This is another view of the same operation that we talked about. And I'm going to now, I mean, based on this concept that we went through, introduce CNNs or convolutional neural networks to you. So CNN means convolutional neural network. Almost everybody in data science world use this term CNN. Convolutional neural networks are too much long to pronounce. So I'm going to use the same term here as well. So CNNs are neural networks that are based on millions of convolution operations. You are just seeing, one, I mean, five or six convolution operations here, but in real practice, in real neural networks, we are going to work with millions of CNN operations. Now, in each convolutional operation, a kernel matrix, which is usually three by three, as I said before, is applied on an input matrix and creates an output matrix that can be a smaller, have fewer values. So look at here, you see that when this kernel matrix goes through all these parameters, all right, you are going to have a final output matrix that is a little bit smaller than this input matrix. Now, what I'm saying here is not always true in real deep learning, right? Sometimes we can trick these kernel operations to generate output matrices with the same size as the input matrix. But for the sake of this presentation, let's assume that these convolutional operations always result in a smaller output matrices, right? And this output matrix, to be honest, has a fancy name. We call that a feature map. So whenever you have an input matrix, you apply a kernel matrix to that using convolutional operations. You are going to have an output matrix that is called a feature map. And the reason we call that this way, you are going to see very soon, right? Now in CNNs, 
convolutional operations on built on top of each other. That means each output feature map like this one, now it's going to be the input feature map for many more convolutional operations, which basically means that now another kernel is going to be applied on this image, right? And this is how we actually use all the pixel values of an image. Imagine that you have 512 by 512 images as inputs. You are going to overlay kernels on them. And then maybe the, after the first round, the output feature map is going to be, let's say 480 by 480 pixels. In the second round, you apply another set of convolutions and then you will have an output feature map that is a smaller. And you keep doing that, keep doing that. Finally, you may come up with you know, maybe an output feature map of three by three, something like that, right? Something that as you see here. And the important point is this. So the fundamental difference between MLPs and CNNs is that in CNNs, the parameters of the model, those parameters that we wanted to learn, those parameters that we took the gradients of loss with respect to them are actually these values of the kernels. So you see this minus one, minus two, minus one, zero, zero. So these are the parameter values. So the number of parameters of a CNN is actually the number of values existing in different kernels that that model has, right? So whenever we are training a CNN, we are actually looking for the best set of numbers for these kernel values. So this might not make that much sense to you at the moment, but let's, let me proceed and you will probably understand better. Now let's, let's, let me first give you a big picture of what is happening here. So this is exactly what I told you. We have an input image. For example, let's say that we apply three different kernels to those. So three different kernels, each kernel has an input, has a different kind of value. So three different three by three matrices. And each of those kernels is going to create a feature map or an output matrix for us. As far as we had three kernels, we are going to have three output feature maps. And now we may add each of these three feature maps to another set of kernels. So three new kernels come here, right? Now you might wonder, why didn't this re result in nine feature maps? Because three fish input feature maps, three kernels, this should be nine output feature maps, right? So this is three here. The convolutional neural networks don't work that easy. They somehow, so each kernel, each new kernel, applies itself on each of these input feature maps, but the final values for each of these feature maps are actually stacked on top of each other. So they are summed together. So for, the, for each kernel, for example, if this value is one, this value is two, this value is three. So suppose that I am going to, you know, uh, apply a kernel that has value two on the, on the equivalent uh, value of its size. So this is going to be now one multiplied by two equals to two, two multiplied by two equals to four, and three multiplied by two equals to six. So we have now values two, four, six. The way that convolutional neural networks work in practice is that they sum these values together. So they actually overlay, overlap these uh, you know, three generated feature maps on top of each other, top, uh, sum their values and say that now this is going to be my main feature map. This is going to be 10, for example. If you didn't understand this part that I mentioned, just ignore that. I mean, this is not important for understanding neural networks. But we, but re I really want you to understand is that you know, convolutional neural networks are kernel operations. They work on each other's output and consider those intermediate outputs as inputs uh, for each other, right? So, for example, these six kernels here work on these feature maps as their inputs and then create new feature maps for us. And we continue this pipeline until the very end when we now uh, play the role of these MLP layers. So these fully connected layers, as I told you, are fancy names for multi-layer perceptron, those simple neural networks that, if you remember, I told you had a lot of problems. They have a problem, they have huge problems, but we can still use them on top of convolutional neural networks. So uh, convolutional neural networks have a lot of convolutions, but usually at the end, they finally, so the values of these final feature maps are now fed through uh, you know, some fully connected layers, the way that we fed that eight, eight image pixel values to that MLP layer. So this is going to be something, again, very simple here. And this is the big pipeline. So, so do you understand this image here for now? Because for now, we, we have covered almost the main part of the convolutional neural network. I have more uh, fancy animations to share with you, but the main concept is what I just told you. Any questions about these convolutions? Okay, I take it as a good sign and proceed to show you more animations, but then we probably can come back to questions again. All right, so 
let's let me now give you an intuition so we went through the mathematical meaning of applying a convolution operation i would like to give you an intuition of what these operations mean each convolution kernel is actually searching an image for a specific feature and for this reason these kernels are also called feature detectors and now you understand why we call this output matrix coming out of an of a convolutional operation a feature map now this a specific kernel that I put here is actually, uh, for example, looking for sharp edges. Now, these values that I put here, this output feature map is now, if you look at that, it is it has very high values, which is which are you know um, near to white because as I told you, values are if values are higher, then the uh, visualization is going to be more white, right? So if you look at where had been highlighted on this image. They are exactly the edge areas of this camel, right? So, so basically, this kernel specifically was designed to pick the, uh, you know, the sharp edges of the images of the input images, and that's why you see here sharp edges are actually highlighted in this image. Now, you might say, how do we know that this specific convolution kernel could detecting sharp edges? Well, people has spent a lot of days in image processing. You no know, literature, and they came up with different kernels, and they understood what kernel could pick, for example, sharp edges, what kernel could pick angles, what kernels could pick, I don't know, for example, circles. So we do have kernels for a specific features that we are interested in. And by features, I mean things like edge, angle, you know, small, tiny things in images or things like that. So you see here that we, this kernel, specific kernel here, is actually detecting sharp edge and then generated this feature map for us. And let's uh, look at another example. So this was a live example that I guess we do not have time to watch now, but the link is here. So go there and try to play with this value of the kernels and see how you how changing of these kernel values could result in different feature maps. So this one, for example, is a kernel for blurring an image. It's really interesting, right? So you just apply a kernel to an image and you make it blurred. So this is how image processing works, right? Even applications like Photoshop, if you want them to blur a part for you, what they do behind the scene is that they usually apply a kernel, pre-specified kernels to your images. And this is how they know what kernels work the best for blurring, what kernels work the best for making it sharper and things like that, right? Increasing the contrast, decreasing the contrast. So kernels can have meaning. This is what I want you to know. Kernels can have meaning. These are not random, vari random values multiplied to each other. Now. Things get even more interesting because, as I told you, convolutional operations are applied to each uh, to previous operations outputs, right? So basically, the first operation detects some features for you, and now a second operation is going to receive these input features as it's another I mean, new set of inputs and create new features, newer features for you. So we have low level features, and then these features are actually fed through new convolutional operations, and they then they generate these mid-level features. And then they are again fed through high level kernels. And by high level, I mean that those kernels are down the line, right? Those are actually applied at the end of the pipeline. And then they just create these uh, different type of features. And now if you ask yourself, how are these features different from each other? You'll probably notice that you know the low-level features are exactly those simple features I introduced in the beginning of this part. I told you that those can detect lines, angles, circles. But what about the mid-level and high-level features? It seems that they are now detecting meaningful things like the eye. Do you see the eye here? Or maybe a flower here? I'm not quite sure. Or maybe something like a sun here, basically. The final kernels of convolutional neural networks, if trained appropriately, are going to be detecting those features that do have meaning and are definitely important for your task that you're training your model for. So for example, if you're training your model to distinguish eight from two, the final features of your convolutional neural networks could be something like a sketch of an eight number, or eight digit, or a sketch of a two digit. And what happens there is that now the final network, the final layers, the final convolution operations are going to understand whether or not features similar to these, or at least a little bit close to these, uh, you know, high level features are existing in your input data or not. And, you know, uh, despite, uh, I mean, in, as opposed to MLPs, these are not now sensitive to the real location of the images. Now, the reason they are not sensitive uh, is actually uh, because of the 
convolution itself and how the convolutions moves into the images. You might not understand this as I say like that, but try to think about that. Convolutions go through the entire image. They scan the entire image for different features. So if I have a kernel for detecting lines, that kernel is going to detect the lines regardless of where that line is in my input image. And now on top of that, if my kernel is looking for eyes, that kernel is going to find an eye into my image regardless of where the eye is. So if I change the location of three digit in my previous slide, if you remember, into in, within the image, the convolutional neural network is still capable of saying that it is a tree, while MLP networks couldn't say so. So this is a nice fancy shape of a convolutional neural network. And again, another shape of that you see here, this is a model trained for detecting. Oh, thank you, Dr. Versandov. I, I think I will finish on time, maybe one or two minutes at most, but I will finish on time. So here you see that another neural network we have, first layer representation. So this network wanted to distinguish human faces. First layer representation, only simple lines. Second layer, things like eyes, nose, mouth. Third layer, real faces. So you see, now our neural networks, our convolutional neural networks can really learn to pick those features that we care about. And if we train them in a decent way, then they are going to learn uh, meaningful features. And to be honest, one of the ways that we have to understand if a model is working nicely or not is that we visualize these features and look at them. Do they really make any sense to us or not? And of course, one thing that I can tell you and very quickly is that, do you remember I told you this is still valuable to transfer learn from uh, you know, models trained on natural images for medical purposes. The reason is that natural images and medical purposes, they definitely do not share any high level feature, but they do share low level features. A cat and my CT scan image are both made of angles and lines. So if a model trained on cat images has a good line detector, let's put the weights from that and put it in my model. Of course, for the higher layers, for the higher convolutional kernels, we need to learn by ourselves. But for lower layers, transfer learning can make a lot of sense. And I believe this is the final uh, concept of a convolutional neural network before I proceed to the references for uh, further learning. And you can now see how a training, how a prediction happens in a uh, real case. You see, the input is actually some real numbers. And you see in a three layer neural network, how the features are formed. So you see that what features the layer one is making, how features the layer two are making. And you see here that after that, we are now trying to make a final prediction value for this, right? So these are the part that, for example, this dense layer is our MLP model. So you see that now everything gets coded, gets embedded. So these features, now that we finally found the main features right here, so this could be a lot of convolutions here, now that we have the final feature that has meaning, now we try to embed them, we try to concise them, focus them to finally get a single value like this, you know, 10 vector here, 10 value vector here saying that this is a zero or this is a six or seven or eight, something like that. Now, in comparison, uh, MLPs are larger, are more difficult and more expensive to train. They are not translation invariant. Uh, they do poor, relatively poor in different jobs. And they are only used in combination in, uh, with CNNs in recent, you know, more recent architecture. So this is something important to keep in mind. I'm going to skip these things for now. These are only comparisons of uh, CNNs and uh, MLP models. The only point of these charts is that, you know, recent architectures are never using MLPs as they stand alone based on architectures they are. And these are the new different type of CNNs you see in the world published. Very quickly, if you are a data scientist, you want to learn machine learning and computer vision, you should first learn Python, then going through Python for data science. We do have a specific libraries in Python designed for data science. Then you should learn conventional machine learning. Probably, this is actually what I prefer to say. Some people say that you could directly go to deep learning, but no, many of the resources out there, they say that it's good to learn at least a little bit of conventional machine learning, then learn the basic and theory of uh, you know, deep learning and how to apply that in Python and then focus on your area of interest, for example, computer vision. And then finally, the most important thing is stay up to date. Deep learning is a very, uh, is a very dynamic field, is a very growing field. New papers come out every day and you should really be uh, up to date. These are book chapters, courses, and if you are interested to go through them, these are the good things that Dr. Erickson and many colleagues in our lab have already tested those. So feel free to test, to test those. I guess all of them are freely available to you if you want to find them. And if you are not a programmer, but are still interested in learning machine learning, a couple of things for you. This book by Eric Topol is a good start point. 
uh, it's not technical, it's not programming, it just tells you uh, what machine learning is about. This uh, course in Coursera does the same thing. And finally, Dr. Erickson's special issue on radiology AI journal, Magician's Corner, does almost the same thing with little bit of coding if also you want to uh, get your feet wet. So this was all I had to share with you. Sorry that it was a longer presentation that are two previous workshops. I would like to thank all the people who helped me and all the mentors. And feel free to contact me if you had questions, if you had comments. And I'm not sure if people want to leave or if they want to stay, but I have time. So if you want to share questions, pay comments, I'm here for you.